excited about the word of the Lord. Uh, before I preach it to others, it's already preached to me. Amen. And we need the word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 16. I do thank God for Brother Reggie, amen, on the keys this morning. Amen. And we thank God for him. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. John chapter 16. Amen. John chapter 16. And once you have it, we want you to go ahead and rest upon your sanctified feet. Amen. If God has blessed you to be able to stand, I want you to stand. Yesterday we, we were uh, smiling and laughing because one man came and ate and uh, came with a cane <laughs> and walked off and left the cane. <laughs> We say the food was so good. <laughs> the food was so anointed. The man forgot he and came walking back full speed to get that cane. <laughs> we say, man, you don't need no cane. <laughs> but we were excited and we just had uh, just good fellowship on yesterday. But I thought that was funny. Amen. Good to see you, Brother DJ. Good to see you today. Amen. You and your lovely family. If they want to go to children's church, they can. The children just left. Amen. Hallelujah. John chapter 16, if you have your holy Bibles, amen. I like what Sister Regina said, you got to have that Bible. Amen. Devices are good, but that Bible is something about the pages and how you write in it, and then you come back and look back to it, and you know, you can hear the wrinkles and all of that. Amen. It's just something that's special. Sometimes, you know, when I study, I put my phone out of the office, office sometimes because that phone, cause you could just keep picking it up. Amen. How many of y'all can testify? I know I'm not by myself. Amen. Sometimes you got to put it aside, go bury it somewhere. <laughs> Amen. John chapter 16. The Bible reads in verse 1, it said, These things, everybody say, These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. He says, They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you, ain't that something? Whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things, everybody say these things. I love it. Have I told you that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you asked me whether goest thou. But because I said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. Last one, of judgment because the prince of the world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Verse 13, how be it when the spirit, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. And he shall glorify me, for he shall receive a mine, and ye shall show it unto you. I want to preach, and we'll underline verse 14 from this topic maintaining hope through the hate maintaining hope through the hate subtopic 
these things. Father, bless us today. God, help us, Lord, to, God, receive your anointing. Help me to preach boldly as I ought to. Let me have precision of speech. God, help me articulate your divine word that it does not fall on deaf ground or bad ground. But, God, I ask that it falls on fertile ground today. And, Lord, we'll give your name the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Maintaining hope through the hate. Jesus said these things. One more time, somebody shout these things. Jesus said these things in the first verse here in chapter 16. He said, these things have I spoken unto you. And the question is, if he starts out in verse 1, these things have I spoken unto you, then the question is, what are these things? Because he hadn't got to all of the things. So he had to be talking about the preceding chapter. The preceding chapter in John chapter 15, you remember, and we discussed it, Jesus was on his way to Calvary. He was... At the time now, there was the Passover, and they were sitting at the Last Supper, and Judas had got up from the table and got ready to betray him and and all of that. And and, in John chapter 14, he's told him, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, and in my Father's house are what? Many mansions. He tells them, I'm going somewhere. Hallelujah. But he said, I want you to remember these things. In chapter 15, he says, I am the true vine. We've discussed this, right? God is the husband man. In other words, God is the vine dresser. Jesus takes us through a class and gives us a lesson on dendrology. Dendrology. Dendrology is the study of trees. And he says here that he throws away branches that are not connected and not constructive. He says, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that's not connected and that's not constructive means that the people that spend their years serving themselves and not God, people that make sure their will is most important and not God's will, people that have no output for God's input. Oh, y'all ain't saying that. He's saying all of them that have received of the goodness of God, yet you're not productive, he says, I throw away. Uh He says, I I get rid of the people that just come church just for church, that just come to look at other people. He says, if you're not productive, then I throw it away. But he says, to those that are productive, I'll purge you. He says, I'll cut you back on purpose to make you even more productive. Say amen. Amen. He says, I I do that because if you're doing good, then I have to cut you down in due season so that when when the time comes, you'll be better than what you were before. Amen. For the devil that you got to face on the next level, God says, I had to cut you on the last level so that you'll be able to handle the new devils. Amen. So he says, so he says here, I cut you. And then he goes on to say that I wash you through the word of God. God puts you in his eternal divine sink and he begins to wash you. You know how we do grapes and vegetables and lettuce and cabbage. We wash it. God says you've been washed by the word of God. But then he goes on to say, he says, now I need you to abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. And if you don't abide in me, he says, if you decide to live a life of self-pleasure, if you decide to live by your own rules, again, he reminds us, you shall be cast forth as a broke branch with it and shall be gathered and thrown into the fire. But then he says, but if you abide, everybody say abide. He says, then you can ask what you will, and it shall be given unto you. He says, that's the gift. That's the reward for your relationship with me. That's the reward for your connection. You can ask what you will, and it shall be given. And then he says that the Father shall be glorified. Then he goes on. I'm just laying the foundation here. But he says, I, he says and I love you like the Father loves me. And then he says, so continue in my love and keep my commandments. And he said this, that your joy might remain and that your joy might be full. Don't let anybody steal your joy. 
He says, I told you this stuff so that your joy might remain. Don't, don't get all crazy. Don't get all doubtful. Don't go into a depression. He says, I told you this stuff so that your joy might remain, that nobody, not your neighbor, not your coworker, not your family member can steal your joy. I told you this so that your joy may remain. But then he goes down in verse 12 of chapter 15. He says, this is my commandment that you love one another. Oh, how much trouble we have with loving one another. Amen. He says that you love one another as I have loved you. In other words, he says you ought to be sacrificial in your love because I was sacrificial with you. Hallelujah. You ought to be merciful with your love because I was merciful with you. You ought to be long suffering in your love because I was long suffering with you. How much junk did God have to go through in your life? And he waited for you, died for you, watched you in sin and still loved you. So he says, since I loved you that way, you should love others that way. Then verse 13, he says, verse 13 says, if you have a problem with that, I want you to reflect on my love. What does it say? He says, greater love have no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. He says, so if you got a problem loving your neighbor, you got a problem loving your wife, your husband, whoever in your life. He said, look at my love because there's no greater love than the love that I have. I laid by, down my life for a friend. How many friends you know that will lay down their life for you? Hallelujah. I guarantee it ain't more than one hand. Amen. That will lay down. And it's probably not the one that you expect. But he says, look at my love. There is no greater love than this. But I want you to dwell in this love. I need you that are called to stay connected and be at peace with one another. Because the church must be strong inwardly if we're going to be strong outwardly. John 15 and 8, 18, it says, if the world hate you, everybody say hate you. Here we go. I want you to underline this because we're going to come back to it. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. He said, if it, if it were of the world, the world would love his own if you were of the world. But because you are not of the world... He says, but I have chosen you out. I've come and plucked you out of the world. That's why you don't get along with everybody. That's why you don't fit into every situation. Because I come, Sister Free, and chose you out of the world. Although you are in the world, I've already pulled you out of the world. And he says, I've chosen you. Therefore, the world hates you. Because you're not like them. Hallelujah. You're, you're not falling around uh, what they call the queen bees or whatever. You're not the Beyonce crowd where you're following Beyonce and following this artist and that artist. You're not of the world. Amen. Some of y'all getting ready to go to Thanksgiving and you're going to probably have a hard time if you believe the Bible and your family don't because they're not going to agree with what you say. You're going to sound like the oddball. You're going to sound like the one that's out of pocket because you are, you've been plucked out of the world. Hallelujah. And the world only love is own. Amen. So, so I told you that because in chapter 16, verse 1, he said, these things I've spoken to you. He said, this, this is the stuff that I spoke to you. I spoke to you to abide in me. I spoke to you to love one another. I spoke to you to understand that if you don't abide in me, you're going to be like a broke branch withered and broken off. He says, I said these things. I spoke it unto you. Look at verse 1. He says, I spoke it unto you that you should not be offended. In other words, he said, so that you don't fall away. You're not surprised because I already told you. I said it unto you so that you don't keep going back. Glory to God. I said this unto you so that you don't lose hope and that you don't go backwards, that you don't regress in your faith. I'm telling you because I want you to remember the stand you need to take for righteousness and that you are not surprised by normal circumstances. He says, I told you this so that you don't drift away. He said these, everybody say these things. He says, I don't want you to drift. Look at this. In verse 2, he says, they shall put you out of the synagogues. Look at that. He says, in other words, they're going to put you out of churches. 
they're not going to like your message. You're not going to fit in. Now, you ought to get comfortable with not fitting in. You're going to fit out when you start following God. Amen. That There will come a time when they will kill you and think that they're doing God a favor. They're going to assassinate your character. They're going to come for you. They're going to attack your name. They're going to try to ruin your reputation. They may even put a post on your own Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. They may, they may say something about you about your family members that you don't like he says they're gonna hate you I don't know why saints of God that we get surprised when people hate us that's in the world I expect for somebody to say those preachers they don't do nothing but steal their money I ran into a guy one day was talking about a preacher so bad I said God bless you I'm Pastor Washington how you doing sir he, yeah yeah he did he start studying yeah 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 man those pastors those pastors and he couldn't finish his sentence why because he was caught up in his self he was of the world the world is not going to love you, but you got to be comfortable with being disliked by somebody. I'm okay when I'm disliked for somebody when, I, when it's unrighteous. When you're unrighteous and you don't like me, that's good because I know I'm doing the right thing. I'm saying the right thing. Sometimes you got to have hard conversations with people when you're standing for righteousness. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus said, I said this. So that you may remember these things that you would remember that I've already given you information. I've already advised you that you would be prepared for persecution, that you would be armed for problems, that that you won't move because I've given you insight before the experience. I need you to write that down. You need insight before the experience. He says, I've given you I've given you insight before the experience. The word of God is insight before the experience. Amen. Jesus was saying if I could get insight into you, if I could get my divine reasoning inside of you, then you will not be surprised by the experience because I prepared you for the experience with my advice that I gave you aforetime. Amen. That, that's why when we were sending our kids, we send our kids to school, we tell them to be prepared. We tell them what to do and what not to do. We tell them the things that they should stay away from because we are preparing them from what they are going to face. And what happens when they do it? We say, now nah, I told you all already. Jesus is saying, I'm telling you this stuff so that you'll be prepared for the experience that you will have. Hey, look at this. He says in verse four, but these things I've told you that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I've said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. Look at this. Oh, this is powerful. Jesus said, I didn't tell you these things before because I was with you. He said, he said I, I could protect you then. I was with you. He says, I could help you then. I was with you. I, I could come for you because I was with you. But now I'm going away from you and I need you to grow up. He says, I need you to be mature. I'm leaving, but I need you to grow up. That's where the church really needs to be. Can I sit right there for a second? The church needs to be in a place where even though somebody or leader is not present, you can handle the responsibility because you've grown up. Hallelujah. If your responsibilities have not increased since you came, then you're not maturing at the level you need to mature. Everybody has to grow up. Since I need you to grow up because I have a greater purpose for you. I have a greater purpose. See, until you grow up, God can't, you, you'll mishandle what God gives you until you grow up. Glory to God. Until you start thinking on another level, and st in, until you start perceiving on another level, until you get spiritual insight, God is not going to give you something because you'll mishandle it. And can I tell you that every leader requires maturity so that other people can move on to greater things? Uh, amen. The head elder, the head missionary, we can't move on to greater if nobody else is going to step up and take the place where they left. When God wants to anoint the head, he anoints the head to be able to move on, but there needs to be somebody coming behind him to be able to follow up the rear. If, 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 I, if I'm called to a greater assignment, that there has to be somebody that can stand in the gap. Glory to God. There has to be a Joshua. There has to be a David. There has to be somebody that can stand and not lose hope and be able to hold it with his shoulders to the plow. Amen. 
Now he need for them, he needed for them to take wisdom and prepare their hearts to face ministry. Glory to God. He says, I'm going, but I need you to get prepared to face what's next. With Jesus, they had seen enough. They had heard enough. They had experienced enough. Now it's time for them to grow up and reach back to the weaker vessels. Churches deal with continual con contention because people stay babies too long. Oh, y'all quiet on me today. I must be preaching on something. They stay babies too long, and the older ones are fighting over the new milk. Glory to God. They're fighting over the new milk so the younger ones can get what they need. Glory to God. Because they're still contending for a position when they should be, uh, they should be raising their level even higher than they were. Yeah. Hallelujah. When, when, I, when I was a kid, we had a, we had a dog named, named Starlight. This dog... This dog was a mature dog. This dog, he uh, was the oldest dog in our yard. Mother Glory, you remember that? The, the oldest dog in our yard. And that dog, that dog would take all the other dogs. When we got a new dog, he would take them out to somehow they would get out the fence and they would go down the highway through the path. And you find out that Starlight was the only one that ever came back. Starlight would take the dog and we say this is, we, fi we figured out that Starlight was a very jealous dog. And she wanted to be the only dog in the yard. So all of a sudden, when the other dogs came, she would find a way to get out the fence. They would follow her. They get hit by a car and start like be the only one coming back. <laughs> Can I tell you, we cannot have starlights in the church. When somebody else comes in, you want to assassinate them and kill them and hurt them. And they can't grow because you're jealous of your position. You ought to be moving up so that they can get what they need. Oh, somebody say amen. We ought to not be like starlight, but we ought to let our light so shine that men may see our good work and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. There's, tell your neighbor there's room for you. There's, there's room. There's room in the body of Christ. You don't have to kill me. You, Hallelujah. I'm just coming to serve God. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to kill me. I just came to bless the Lord. Hey, I just came to get what God has for me. Verse 5, he says, but now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you ask me. Oh, now here is the tension in the text. I want y'all to see this right here. He says, but now I go my way to him. Ooh, underline this part right here. He says, and, and, he says, and none of you asketh me, whether goest thou? He says, but because I've said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. He says, I'm leaving but since I said this was about to happen to you, you've asked me nothing about me now. You've asked me, your, your mind immediately went to yourself. So it was now self-preservation. Jesus implies that when I talked about suffering about me, you had many questions. But now that I'm talking about your suffering, you ain't got nothing to say. <laughs> You remember, Jesus was saying, I'm getting rejected by the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. They're going to persecute me. He says, they're going to kill me, and then I'm going to be raised up on the third day. And Peter, said, Peter pulls Jesus to the side and rebuked them. And Jesus said, well, I got to rebuke you, Satan, because what you're saying ain't right. That's not the spirit of God. But Peter was so adamant to fight for Jesus when it was about Jesus. But now that it's about them, he says, sorrow has filled your heart. Isn't that amazing how somebody will shout for you, glory to God, when you're going through, I'm praising God for you, but when you're going through, we can't find you. You're quiet now. Now that it's happening to you, you told me to go through my season with my head up. You said God is going to reward me. God is going to work it out, but now it's your turn, and sorrow has filled your heart. He said, he said, he said, what? He said, what in the world? Oh, stand on his holy word. We got all the scripture. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. God is going to make weeping may endure for a night. Joy come. No, it's your turn. He says, now sorrow has filled your heart. This is the tension in the text that I want y'all to see today. Jesus said, oh, it, it was all right when it was on me. But now it's on you, and I'm telling you that people are going to hate you because you know me. People are going to want to kill you because you're connected to me. 
He look at this. Jesus said, sorrow has filled your heart, not for me, but for yourself. Maturity is when I'm in trouble, but I have enough word in me that I can still be concerned about others. Hmm. Yeah, it, it, maturity is when, you know, I, I'm a person, uh, when, you, when you mature, I may be struggling with my own finances, but I'll still bring somebody a plate. That's maturity. Y'all, y'all, y'all ain't going to say nothing to me. I, I, I can pray, even though I'm having trouble praying for myself. Uh, hallelujah. I can still pray for you. That's maturity. I, I can comfort you, even though I'm having problems to encourage myself. That's maturity. Tension in the text is he says, sorrow has filled your heart. So the question is, up until this point, was it ever about Jesus or was it about them? Because he says, now you ain't got nothing to say now that I'm talking about you. So was it ever about me or was it about what you can get from me? Was it ever about me or was it you just being connected along my side and that you're going to get a position in the kingdom? Was it ever really about Jesus? Oh, that's the question I got to ask all of us. Is it about Jesus is it, or is it about your neighbor? See, when, when, it's a, when it's about Jesus, nobody has to pump you or prime you to give God praise. Nobody has to make you come to prayer. Nobody has to make you come to Bible study. No, because it's about Jesus. But Jesus said, is it, was it about me? Because now sorrow has filled your heart. When I told you, you're about to go into the worst season of your life. Where's your shout now? Where's your praise now? Where's your hallelujah now? Where's your many are the afflictions of the righteous now? Where is all your word? Do you still have a word, although you're about to suffer? He said, one, one question. He said, I got to ask you, do, do, do you, did you really come for me? Or did you come huh, for another position? The question we got to ask ourselves is, did we come for Jesus? Even today, did we come to receive or did we come to give? Or did you come for both? Most people come just to receive, but they never come to give. Did you come to give worship? Did you come to give praise? Did you even come to give a smile? Somebody showed up and just needed you to show your pearly whites. Amen. Or off whites. Whatever you got. He he said, I saw people came just to see you. Y'all ain't saying that to me. Glory to God. Some people came. Did you come to give anything? I don't know about you. When I come to ministry, I come to church. I'm happy to see you. I come to give and I come to receive. I come to give to the Lord and I come to receive from the Lord. But see, it seems to me in the text that they will focus on what I can receive from Jesus, but not what they can give. Jesus said, you're about to give your life. Yeah, yeah. But, but it, do you come for what you can offer? Glory to God. See, when you're fully grown, your life is a drink offering. Paul said that. He said, my life is a drink offering. Yes. Yeah. It's poured out as a drink offering. I can help because God keeps pouring into me. My life is a drink offering. I, I, I. See, when your life is a drink offering, when you run into people, glory to God, you might not even want to pour, but you feel find yourself pouring. 